to be here with you this morning to see your beautiful faces and hear the chatter. I absolutely love it. Uh, we have a lot of stuff going on. I want to encourage you, if you did not pick up a, a bulletin or a handout today, that you do so. There's lots of fun announcements on there. We have stuff happening all the time in this building, and I'd love to encourage you just to uh, take part in any of those. We have our regular Wednesday night service soon. That's 6 o'clock. Um, um, if you don't come out to that, you're missing out because it's a great time of fellowship in the Word. And uh, there's nothing better to do than read the Word of God together as a body and just to uh, digest it together, talk about it together. So uh, get involved. There's various activities. Um, Costa Rica is coming. There's an opportunity for you to take part in our new Costa Rica team coming for our 2020 year. Um, and I really want to encourage you. We, we met last Wednesday night for those of you that were interested. If God is still working on you and you're still saying, I don't know, um, continue to pray and ask God if he uh, would want you to say yes. And let us know. Um, we want to know by the end of September, I believe, the commitment of exactly um, who is going. And we'll have more details on that. Uh, but we do need to start planning our team, uh, knowing how many people are going so that we know what we can actually do when we're there. Uh, we can't plan on a massive PBS for a community if we have three people helping. So uh, we need to kind of plan. So if you know now, uh, begin letting us know. But if you're unsure, you're on the fence and you have questions, please feel free to ask myself. I am our coordinator for the church. You can ask Pastor Josh too, he's been there. There's many other people who went on the team two years ago, last year. I don't remember when it went, 2018. Um, and they will be able to give you just what we did when we were there. So. Uh, I know some people think, well, I can't do anything anymore. You can. There's lots to do. Don't allow your age or your, what you think are your limitations to hold you back. Um, if God wants you there, he will provide a way and he will make a way and he will find exactly the perfect thing for you to do while you're there. Um, not only will you be ministering to the people in Costa Rica, but I guarantee you the Lord will bless you beyond all measure. So why don't we take this time now uh, just to greet one another and um, fellowship.
uh, it's good to worship him through the giving of our tithes and offering. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for uh, just everything that you are. Jesus, we, we, we love you so much. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, receive this offering today, Lord Jesus, that you would be honored, that you would be glorified by it, Lord Jesus, that you would receive it, that you would bless the gift and the giver today, Lord Jesus. We pray that you would receive not just uh, our tithe this morning, Lord, but you would receive our worship, that you would receive our praise today, that it would bring glory to you, that it would honor you, Lord Jesus. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise him, all you sinners. Sing, oh, sing to weary. Oh, praise him, all you children of God. We lift high his glory. Show
God is so good. I, I you know I've said this before, but I always, I just, uh, you just sense his spirit here today. Yes. Yeah. Spirit's great, right? uh, I know I've said before, there, there are times, uh, even as your pastor, I can confess, uh, the word of God promises that wherever two or more are gathered in his name, that he is there. So we know he's Amen. here. And there are times that that's really a faith statement. <laughs> Sometimes it's like, man, God, I know you're here. But man, it doesn't take a lot of faith today. I just sense the spirit here. I know that God has something special planned for us today. And I want to uh, share a story that we may know out of Mark chapter 10. We're going to look at verse 46. We're going to talk about a guy named Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus. And uh, I'm going to read his story real quick. Mark chapter 10, verse 46. It says this. It says, Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on him. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Listen to this. This is a profound statement right here. Verse 49, Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped. He said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. And listen to this question. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Amen. That's a good story, isn't it? I love that story. And as we think about that, I want us to kind of uh, get a picture of what's happening here and, and kind of get a picture of the scene. And, and so Jesus is, is on his way to Jerusalem. Uh, I, I say this often, but this is one of those stories in the, in the scriptures of, of Jesus on the way somewhere. So much of our walk with God and so much of our, our faith happens on the way. We think about the destination so much, but I want to tell you, whatever you're on the way to right now, God wants to do something in your life right now. He's here. Uh, and so they're on the way, and Jesus is passing by, uh, passing by and uh, uh, he comes to this area, and he comes across this guy, Bartimaeus. And there comes a time, I believe, in every single life, every human life, there comes a time when Jesus passes by. And how we respond to Jesus is of eternal significance and importance. Amen? Amen. And so Jesus is passing by... <laughs> You think about what's going through Jesus' mind this day. It's probably hot. It's been warm here. It's been hot. I don't, I don't like the heat. And I know I don't live in the right area if I don't like the heat. But it's just been a little too hot. But I bet you it was really hot where they were. And it was dirty and it was dusty. We went to the beach yesterday and it was, it was kind of hot. But you get sand everywhere. It's just gross. You know? It's kind of fun, but then when you're done and it's it's like you take the beach with you, and it's like, eh, that's no fun. They were probably dusty, they were dirty, they were walking, they were traveling along, it was hot. And, and, and this, the crowd is gathered, and people are yelling, and they're shouting. You know, Jesus, sometimes I don't know if we think about this, but, 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 but Jesus was kind of a, I don't want to make light of who he was, but he was kind of a celebrity. Yeah. He was a controversial figure. Yep. And so when Jesus came to town, People were like, we gotta go check this guy out. Um, it was kind of a thing, you know, like, oh. And, and anytime a rabbi would come to town, rabbis really, they were, in, in those days, I, I gotta tell you, as your pastor, I'm not much of a local celebrity. People don't care when I show up at Chili's. We, there's not a special section for us, nobody comes, uh, and that's okay. But but it was a little different back then. When, when, when a rabbi or a relig religious leader would come to your town, it was an event, it was a big deal. These, it, it, they were important people uh, in the in, in kind of public mind. And so Jesus has this crowd, and they're probably yelling. Jesus had to be used to people yelling things at him all the time. Or saying, hey, you know what, what? Whatever they were yelling, the noise. And so he's just walking, all the noise. 
and, 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 and he comes across Bartimaeus here. And not only that, Jesus is only days away at this point from his death. He knew what he was walking to. Disciples hadn't figured it out yet. But Jesus knew there had to be a lot on his mind. That's what I'm trying to share with you. Jesus uh, uh, was, had a lot going on. Is that fair to say? You ever feel like you have a lot going on? Guess what? Yes. Jesus had a lot going on. Yes. He had a lot going on. Amen. And he comes across this guy, Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus comes to Jesus as he's walking to his mission, as he's walking to the place, he's walking to where they're going to celebrate Passover for the last time with his disciples before he would go to the cross. Jesus is aware of this. I, I, I think that this time, everything that Jesus did in the, in the Gospels is so important. But I think as we get closer and closer to that time where Jesus knows he's going to be arrested, as we get closer to the time when we know that, that, that the cross, is that shadow of the cross is just looming over him. That then everything that Jesus said and did as that gets closer to the, it had to be so, there had to be such significance to that. Again, not, not that there wasn't significance to everything that he did, but, but do you know what I, you know what I'm saying? That Jesus, he was on a mission, he was thinking, he was going somewhere, there's people all around him, he was focused. But, but this guy, this, this, this blind beggar named Bartimaeus caused him to stop. That's significant to me. And, and, and listen, I, I have to believe that there were a lot of people calling Jesus' name. Hey, hey, Jesus, over here, over here. But there was something about this guy that caused Jesus to stop what he was doing and take note. You hear what I'm saying? Amen. I want us to understand this picture, the, the significance of, of uh, Jesus kind of just stopping in his tracks. And so we look at this guy, we look at Bartimaeus, and there's, there's, there's three things, uh, there's a lot of things uh, about him that we can spend time with him, but there's three specific things I want us to kind of see about Bartimaeus today that, 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 you know, he probably didn't have the easiest life. He had some things going against him. The first one, the, the indicators in his name, Bartimaeus. That's not necessarily his given birth name. Bar, I'm telling you, you ever notice there's a lot of bar names in the Bible? Bar means son of. And so Bartimaeus, there, there's two words that uh, uh, Timaeus could resemble in, in, in Aramaic. Uh, one would say, there are some scholars that, that believe that his, his name, what Mark is trying to say about Amen. Bartimaeus, is that he was a son of honor, mm. or the son of one who gives honor, which works for this passage. But the other reading, the other word that Timaeus could be a, a, a root word of is, is son of the unclean. The unclean one. Or, or to, to, to get a little more biblical in our language, son of the defiled one. See, it was, it, 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 it was a statement about his identity and who he was. He was blind. And in that time, in that culture, you weren't just randomly blind. You were blind because you had done something wrong or because your parents or especially your father was this great sinner or had done something to bring this wrath up. You weren't just blind. You earned it. God gave that to you. I don't know we don't, we don't believe that, but, but that was the common hell belief in that day. And so uh, we see that just by his name, how would you like that to be your name? How would you like that on your uh, 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 the defiled one, the unclean one. See, he was defined by his illness. He was defined by his handicap. He was defined by his shortcoming. So that's not good. His name's the first indicator that he may have had a rough time. The second thing, uh, he was a beggar. He was a beggar. He was living meal to meal. He was just hoping that somebody would be generous enough to give him some money so that he'd get something to eat and feed himself. He lived on the streets. Right. He lived on the road and he just had the clothes on his back or the cloak that covered him. He, I'm sure they weren't nice clothes. I'm sure he, he really probably didn't have a chance to bathe or clean himself very much. He, uh, uh, he was known as a beggar. He was known as an unclean one and he was known as a beggar. It's not good. It's exposed to the weather. 
And three, he was a blind beggar. He was a blind, not only was he a beggar, he was a blind beggar. I, I think one of the hardest things I can imagine is, is um, I, man, I love seeing things. I love, I couldn't even went to the beaches. I love the ocean. I love looking out at the ocean and just thinking about how, how insignificant, how significant the ocean is to me and how insignificant it is to God. I'm just reminded of God's glory and greatness when I go take a walk on the beach. Don't take a walk on the beach after church today. Just be like, man, God, you're awesome. <laughs> Beautiful. I love to go to the mountains. The, our teens are going to camp this week. Be praying for our teens. I love them. I love just seeing the beauty of creation. I could imagine not having my sight. It's such a gift. But as hard as it would be to not have sight in 2019 in America today, I bet you it was worse back then hmm. to not be able to see. And, and to have people think that the reason you couldn't see is because there was something wrong with you or your family that you deserved us. That, that, that because you couldn't see, you were also a social outcast. You were unclean. And by being unclean, that meant you weren't allowed to go to the temple. You weren't allowed to go to church, which was kind of the social center. You, you weren't allowed to do all kinds of things because you would bring your uncleanness into those things. Wouldn't have been fun. It would have been a hard thing. So, so Bartimaeus had a lot going against him. But Bartimaeus had somewhat of a clue of who Jesus was. And as Jesus was passing by, I wonder if he knew what the prophet Isaiah said. In Isaiah 35, verse 5, it says that the Messiah would come and that he would heal the blind. And so he had some kind of understanding that this Jesus, if he's the Messiah, he's my own hope. He's He's the one that can save him. And so he calls out to him. We read, he calls out, verse 47, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And at that first call, does Jesus stop? No, oh, he keeps going. You know why? I bet you it was noisy. I, that's why I think there were a lot of people calling out to Jesus. And, and, and he lets out this, this, this shout, Jesus, son of David. And by saying son of David, he's declaring that I'm not just looking at you as, as, as the latest rabbi. I don't just see you as some great teacher. He's declaring, I believe that you're the Messiah that Isaiah talked about. Yes. He's declaring something that even the disciples, I don't think, had fully gotten there yet. So this, this blind beggar that had everything going against him maybe knew more about Jesus than some of the people that had been traveling with him all this time. Amen. He declares, David. And what do the disciples do? This is why I think maybe he understood more about Jesus than they did. Those that were traveling with Jesus and some of the crowd, they said, hey, 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 you're just the beggar. You're just Bartimaeus. You're the unclean one. You're just the beggar on the side of the road. He didn't got time for you. He's, this is an important guy. He's got things going on. He's got places to go. He's got places to be. Be quiet. And think about what would this story, how would it have ended if he just was like, oh, okay. Guess I just got to know my place. But, but the scripture says that he it, it, it didn't stop him. Verse 48, many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but, but he shouted all the more. So he shouted louder, Jesus, son of David. And Jesus stopped. He stopped. Years ago, I was talking to a uh, 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 a, a guy who's a lifeguard. And I always think um, uh, that would be a hard job at a crowded beach because everybody's running around and splashing around. Kids are yelling. Everybody's hollering. And I said, how do you know? Like, like, aren't you scared that, like, how do you know what to respond to? He said, you know what? When somebody thinks they're drowning and somebody's really in trouble, <coughs> you can hear that in their cry. Amen. And then there's no mistake. And I believe that Bartimaeus came to that point with Jesus just where maybe the first time, Jesus, you know, if you could stop, it'd be great. And then as they tried to quiet him down and Jesus was getting further and further away from him as he passed by, the desperation sank in, but also his faith was increased that this is the guy, this is the guy that can do something for me. And he cries out in his desperation and Jesus hears him. 
It's like a lifeguard, even better. He, he hears the heart, not just the head of the Christ. That Bartimaeus is like, well, let me see if he can stop. But it, it had gone to a place in his heart and began to cry in his heart. And he said, Jesus, son of David, Jesus stops. I think sometimes, church, I've got to tell you, as Christians, as individuals, but as a church, I think we need to learn to cry out to God again sometimes. Amen. Amen. I mean that. Yes. Like, like really cry out to God and be aware of our desperation and be aware of our need and say, God, we mess. We're a mess and we need you. I don't have all the answers. I don't know how to fix what's going on in the world. Sometimes it feels like a losing battle. Doesn't it feel like a losing battle? I'm just being honest with you guys. Yes. As the church, i got to tell you, sometimes, and I'm not talking about the Torres Church in the Nazarene, I'm talking about the Church of Jesus Christ worldwide. It feels like we're losing ground sometimes. I'm going to be brutally honest. It feels like that a lot. And we can analyze that. And we can look at all the ills of society and all the, the horribly worldly things out there and we can point our fingers and say, but, but I wonder if we stop crying out to God. Like, like, like Bartimaeus, in, in a way that makes him stop. Yes. Like they're really desperate for you. Or if we resigned ourselves, this is just the way the world is. This is just the way it's coming. Let's write it out the best that we can. And as the church, I think we need to learn again to cry out to God. Do you, do you, do you hear what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Amen. Like really cry out to God. That's as God's people. And I don't think that's just as, as, as his people, but I think as individuals, I think of things in my life. That I'll be real honest with you. Things, breakthroughs that I need in my life that I stop crying out to Jesus. Amen. I've kind of let him pass by. Like, well, you know, I kind of, I don't know, didn't work out. Or, but, but, but how many of you need a miracle? Or how many of you need a breakthrough in your life? Don't stop crying out to Jesus. Amen. Be aware of your need and your desperacy. Bartimaeus knew, like, it's only Jesus that can do anything about this. And I believe that some of us, I don't think I'm the only one, are at a point in some things in our life where we're like, I, I can't do anything else. Jesus is the only one at this point. Don't give up. Cry out for that breakthrough. God hears the cry of our hearts. And the thing is this, is when we really start seeking God, when we really start radically moving towards God, i got to tell you something. You can be sure, you can be for sure, that there are going to be people around us that are going to discourage us from that. Yes. There are going to be people in the world that say, you're crazy. Just, you know, that, that's silly. You're just a fanatic. <laughs> but you know what's more painful? I think, I think I can handle that. I'm okay with that. You know what's more painful? See, Bartimaeus didn't just have worldly... Uh, uh, godless people yelling at him to be quiet. He had people that were following Jesus telling him, hey, be quiet. Mm. You know, it's painful sometimes when from within the walls of the church, maybe not even intentionally so, but there, there could be people where you could get a sense that people saying, hey, 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 settle down. Here. That's just the way it is. Don't be too crazy. You don't want to be labeled a fanatic. And that's painful when sometimes maybe even the church, the people of God, try to quiet the cry of our heart. I, I'm, I'm just being real. Amen. You don't have to raise your hand. Please don't. But you ever feel like that? Man, I got to put a show on for people around me. They can't know that I'm desperate. They can't know that my immense need from God. I'm gonna, I, I'll reveal something about all of us. Right? We're all desperate. We're all in desperate need for a touch from Jesus today. I'm desperate for you today. I need a touch from Jesus today. I am Amen. with you. Yes, we don't have to be ashamed of that. We don't have to put a show on for the people around us like, man, I got everything worked out. I got everything figured out. I'm, I'm good to go. And I'm broken. I feel like the unclean one sometimes. I feel, I feel just trapped by my past. I feel trapped by and defined by things in my life that maybe I don't even have any control of. Jesus, I need you today. I need you for my breakthrough. You start desperately seeking the Lord, church. I've got to tell you something. People are going to be 
People are going to discourage you. Don't give up. Don't let people discourage you. Amen. I, uh, I remember years ago at another church, uh, we had a, uh, every week we had uh, the same, the same fella came to the altar every week. By the way, this altar is always open. There's nothing magical about it, but it's just a place where symbolically we come and just sometimes do business with God, amen? You know what's beautiful about this? This is not a magical altar. The altar can be a few. The altar can be your your, your favorite cherry house. You can do business with God. It's a beautiful thing. But this fellow came down to the altar every Sunday, and um, Pastor Mike, our pastor over there, he, he had shared a story where um, he essentially asked him, "You know, why do you come to the altar every 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 week?" And I don't, want, I don't want to take this too far into a different direction, but, but essentially there's a thought sometimes that like, well, you know, God knows what you need. You don't need to come to the altar every, every <laughs> week. You know, you don't need to come to the altar all day. Right? We, we just, God knows what you need. But the response that he had to that question was like, man, I'm waiting for my mirror. And he was praying for something specific. And he said, not only will I wear the carpet down to that altar from walking down there until I get my miracle, I'll wear the concrete down. I'll be a path. I'm not giving up. And I never forgot that. I said, man, I like that. <laughs> and that's not a lack of faith. Man, that's faith. That's crying out to Jesus saying, yeah, I don't know what else to do, God. I'm bringing it to you again. I'm bringing it to you again. I'm not getting tired of it. I'm not... I'm not giving up. I'm waiting for this breakthrough in my life. I'm still battling this, this, this addiction in my life. It's not broken, Jesus. I need you. I don't know what else to do. And I'll wear the concrete down just from walking on it so much to the altar. And we need that in our church. We need that in our lives. Barbaeus was willing to face human ridicule to be able to be close to Jesus, to touch God. He was desperate. He had no other way out. Jesus was his only answer. The more they told him to, to be quiet, to shut up, the more it just focused him on Jesus, the more it just made him cry out. And getting to Jesus, we talked about fire last week. It became the all-consuming passion, the fire in his life that was the drive. That, and I'm just going to get to Jesus. And I think God's people got to get some of that consuming fire, man. I just want to get to Jesus. I want to be close to him. I want to, I want that touch from God. It's not enough. This faith stop Jesus. I think, um, I love, uh, I, I love to read, uh, I love to read, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, but I, I love fiction. I, I love novels. I love uh, I love stories. And, and the best stories, uh, my favorite books, are ones that are about something but are kind of about something else too. You know what I mean? I love Lord of the Rings because it's just kind of this crazy, weird, fantastical adventure. But there's all kinds of stuff in Lord of the Rings that are really about other things. There's all kinds of subtext. It doesn't matter. This isn't a message on Lord of the Rings, but uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis did the same things with his stories. Um, I remember a few, few years ago, maybe a couple years ago, me and Larry, concurred, we didn't like read it together, like meet and read, but we concurrently, I had always wanted to read Moby Dick. And so I was like, I'm going to do it. And now let me tell you, I'm glad I did it, but that was a book to get through. <laughs> it was interesting. But what was cool, you know what got me through? Because it, it is wordy. And it is, um, I'm going to say it's not action-packed. Um, it's not all about, uh, whatever. But what got me through was so interesting about it. Because Moby Dick really is not about a white It's about something else, isn't it, Larry? It's about, it's about obsession. It's about, uh, it actually is a lot of biblical allegory. See, it was a story. It was a story. Ah, but it was about something else. Those are the best stories. I love them. 
Love digging into that. And what's interesting about this little section of, of Scripture here is the author, Mark, he's kind of doing this. Now, this is a true story. This happened. Bartimaeus was a real guy. And, and, and we can read that. And sometimes we read this story and we kind of think about it like it's just another miracle story. That sounded horrible, huh? Just another miracle story, right? Big deal. But we kind of read it like it's just, oh, this is a story about one of Jesus' miracles. It is one of his miracles. It's great, but, but, but Mark is telling us something more than just Jesus is a miracle worker. In fact, this is a, a, a section of scripture uh, that they believe Mark is using these stories to encourage the people, the body of Christ, to go deeper into their relationship with Christ. It's not just about, oh, hey, he's a miracle worker, but there's something about Bartimaeus' heart and his prayer and his cry to Jesus that Mark wants us to see in ourselves. They want, he wants us to see Bartimaeus' condition in us and his response in us. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's more than just a miracle. And I don't want us to miss that today. Before we leave, I want us to understand that, that, that Bartimaeus is a story of the human race. It's a story of you and me. It's, it's our story. The intent of this story is that we would see ourselves and our own condition in Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus is a story about uh, a broken man and the brokenness of humanity. Uh, the Greek word for Bartimaeus being blind gives the indication that he was not born blind, but that he had a condition that caused him to slowly lose his sight. And by the time we meet Bartimaeus in this story, he was completely blind. But see, Bartimaeus was desperate for something that he once had that he had lost. He wanted something back. Sin has blinded us to who God is. It's Amen. separated us from the goodness of, 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 of who Christ, of who God is, who he's, the relationship that he's created for us. If you go all the way back into Genesis, it's interesting. You read Genesis, and as he creates Adam and Eve, one of the amazing things about that story, sometimes I, I don't know if you think about this, but, but that, that, that they were hanging out in the garden, and who was hanging out there with them? Not in spirit, not in... God was just there. They're just talking to him like, oh, hey, God. Isn't that amazing? That was their relationship, though. They didn't have to hide themselves from God. They were, they, were, they were in the full glory of God. In fact, when they fall <clears throat> after they sin, and they uh, go and they, and, and, and they hide themselves because they know they're naked. What, do you remember why it says they hid themselves? Because they heard God's footsteps. They heard him coming. They heard the, the crunching leaves or the sticks or something. I, I mean, think about that for a minute. That's an amazing relationship with the Creator. They're just hanging out with God. With God. And then they said, and it's interesting, after that, um, they're, they're cast out from the garden. And you would think, oh, that, that relationship with God ends. But it doesn't. You know why? Because when Cain and Abel are bringing offerings, God's not as pleased with, with, with Cain's offerings. Uh, and you can read this in Genesis chapter 3. But um, Cain, we know the story, murders Abel. And what happens? God shows up. Not in prayer, not in vision. He shows up. Cain, where's your brother? He's just having a conversation with God. Like me and Larry. I'll let you decide which one's going to, is, is God and which one's Cain. But, but just, just, uh, what, am I my brother's keeper? The answer to that is always yes, by the way. <laughs> yes, you are. But see, but see, Cain is still enjoying, even after the fall, this, this, this closeness to God. But I've, I've, I've not yet experienced that. I've never, I've never, listen, I, I know the Holy Spirit's here. I know His presence is here. I know the Spirit's here. But I've never physically stood with God like that. us 
We're losing our sight of the goodness of God little by little because of sin in our life. And we're desperate. And even though humanity doesn't know, you want to know what? Humanity is desperate to get that back. Like Bartimaeus was desperate to get his sight back. We, we do our best. You know why there's so much political turmoil and there's so much anger and, and even hatred in our society today? On any side, this is not a political statement. This is a heart statement right now. It's because every side is desperate for some of that peace and some of that love and some of that grace. That's been, and, and, and we all have our own ideas of how to get that. But I want to tell you today, we got to let go of all of God hasn't called us to be political experts. He's called us to be people of his word. Amen. And the only answer today is like Jesus is, is his people. We've got to come back to a place of desperation. It's only Jesus. I don't know Republican. I don't know Democrat. I don't know any of that. I just know Jesus. Amen. Jesus, we need you. But the reason that everybody's so divided is everybody's desperate for that. And we're removed. We're desperate for something that we used to have. We're yes. desperate for something that we don't have anymore. Mm. Amen. And it's, how, it's, it's who God created us to be. God created us to be in relationship, perfect relationship with Him. He's created us to be in perfect relationship with His creation, with each other, with the world around us. This world we live in, that was, that was not God's intent. That was not God's plan or purpose for you. And people are desperate to receive that back. And Bartimaeus is blind, he's powerless, he's broken, he's an outcast. That's our story. That's your story. I don't, I don't know how to, you know, I tell people all the time, I have people, Pastor, how do you know? How do you know God is real? How do you know? And I just know. You know what? The answer to that, there's no substitute for the Holy Spirit. There's no substitute for his presence. There's no, there's no program that I can present to you that's going to change your heart. There's no sermon in and of itself that I can share with you that's going to change your heart and your mind. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can do that. Amen. But we try so hard to manufacture peace. We try so hard to manufacture uh, just, just goodness and we'll always fall short. We'll never do it. It's a story of us. I, uh, it's interesting. We had BBS a couple uh, we had BBS a couple weeks ago. A couple weeks ago? It was like a long time ago. I don't know if that means that was a long week or... <laughs> it was a good week. But um, we had BBS, and BBS is so important. We had kids here. We had our, you know, our own kids from our church, which are, are, we love them, and they're so important. We had kids, too, that, that don't go to church anywhere. That show, you know, kids like to show up for BBS. And one of the reasons BBS is so powerful, in fact, I know... There were prayers for children that week. Um, testimonies of, of children that gave their life to Jesus that week for the first time. Amen? Amen. That's worthy of celebration. <laughs> and you know what one of the easiest times to reach somebody for the gospel is? I don't want to discourage us. I don't want us to give up on uh, adults or teens or anything like that. But the easiest time statistically that people have a lifelong changing event with, with Jesus happens before 12 years old. Yeah. I don't think that's coincidental. You know what I think that is? I think that kids are not as far removed from that relationship with God. They haven't lost their sight yet. And we can get in there and we can share with them something that's very familiar. Not because they're not smart, they're, they're super smart. Because they're more familiar than we are with something that we once had. Well, right. They're closer to it. Amen. I believe that. Amen. I don't think it's an accident. I don't think it's, it's coincidence. I don't think it's a programming issue. I think it's a heart issue. And we need to pray for our kids. Not just our kids at this church. We need to pray for our schools. Hmm. We pray for our young people. <laughs> Number two. So Bartimaeus is a picture of all of us. It's our story. And Mark wants us to see ourselves in Bartimaeus and, and in his brokenness and in his, his chains and what holds him back. We, we share those things. Number two, Bartimaeus was a signpost, a, a signpost pointing to uh, the way to transformation. He's a picture of somebody who understands who's coming down the road. He may not have known everything about Jesus. 
I'm sure he didn't have perfect theology. I'm sure he really hadn't studied theology much at all. But he understood a foundational truth about Jesus that all the experts have missed. He knew enough to say, this is the guy. This is the Messiah. This is the son of David. This is the one that can heal my sight and give me what I want today. This is the one. This is him. And he declares it. He desperately wanted to no longer be blind, but to be able to see. And see, I, I think that Bartimaeus understood something about himself, too, that the people around him did. See, he didn't only understand something about Jesus. He understood something about himself that I think we need to take notes from. Bartimaeus understood his own desperation. Bartimaeus, if he didn't, he would have listened to him when they said, hey, be quiet. You're disrupting this very important business right now. I think I've shared with you uh, a story again, and, and I love it. I would never stop it. But um, I remember when my kids were pretty little. When we first came to this church, our kids were pretty young. Um, I think our oldest were in first grade. Yeah, so it was, it was a little while ago. But they would uh, uh, hang out down here during worship. And the kids still do that, and I love it. I encourage it. I want more of it. But they would, they would come down here and they'd dance during worship, man. Remember that? Yeah. They still do it. At least they'll come down here. I have your girls get down here. They get busy. It's good. I love it. But I remember when it was my kids when we first came here. I freaked out. The like, whoa. They're going to distract people. They're going to disrupt people. And, and you know, it, it was only one Sunday before God convicted me. I remember going to go and say, hey, guys, guys. Some kid stand, some kid clap, but don't, you know, you gotta, you gotta calm down now. And I remember, I remember coming in from church, and I remember having that conversation with him. And I remember going in for my, my, my Nazarene nap after after church. I couldn't sleep, gosh darn it. My, I, I broke my nap. <laughs> I just didn't feel good about it. You know, Prayed about that. And I went to the scriptures and I was like, man, that's the last thing I want to train my kids out of. If anything, I need to be doing what they're doing. I just need to be excited. I need to be willing to cry out, even if it looks silly, even if it's distracting to somebody. I don't care. If it's about Jesus, that's all it's about. Amen? Amen. I don't want to train that out of our kids. That's one of the reasons you want to know what? That's why uh, uh, we have the kids in here for the beginning of service. You ever wonder why? Why don't they just go to each other? Because I want to, one, to see that we value declaring who God is and praising God and worshiping Him. And two, you know what? Because maybe they can model to us a little excitement in that. <laughs> maybe they'd be a little contagious. We don't want to train that out of our kids. We want to train it into us. I want to tell you, they're closer to that than we are. That's right. Amen? Amen. Well, they just had that. I don't care. I don't care if I'm disrupting all you experts and scholarly people and all you put together, uh, you know, like, like, oh, you know, we're so, uh, uh, yeah, so dignified. Thank you. There you go. What did King David say? I'll become even more undignified than this. I don't care. I don't care. Church needs some of that. Not in an aggressive, mean way, but in a, man, I just love the Lord and I need the Lord today and I love Him and I praise Him today. Church, we need that. I want to tell you what, when somebody doesn't know Jesus and they come to a church that doesn't seem like they really need Jesus or care about Jesus, that's not infectious. It's like, eh, they don't really care either. <laughs> it's okay. Man, I just love you, Lord. I love you. Amen. Kids got that. Man, BBS. It's exhausting. They got, but I, I think I shared that they're, the, the adults and the kids are on reverse trajectories. BBS would have noticed this. The first night, the adults are amped. You got BBS week, kids. I knew it says it's going to be awesome. The kids are like, yeah, you know. It's fine. Twin snack time, right? What do we got for snacks today? And then last night, the adults were like, oh. We going short tonight, but <laughs> I gotta go to bed. I'm tired. And the kids are like, "Man, God is good." That was the thing. God is good. 
Their shouts get louder by the end of the week, man. It's just that they're amped up with Jesus. It's so good. It's so good. We need some of that, church. You know what? And I would say this. It's not about emotion. We don't need that. I would even say this. You know, when, we, we, when we're, we're feeling that way is not when we need it the most. If you're feeling that way, absolutely. Let's do it. But you know, I, I would say we need it the most when we're not feeling that way. And then I'm going to praise as a discipline. Because it's not about me, but it's because of his worthiness and who he is. Yes. Amen? Amen. He was a signpost pointing the way to transformation. Bartimaeus shows that we want something bad enough from God. We shouldn't let anyone get in our way. Church, don't let anyone get in your way. Amen. I believe that Jesus stops in all of our lives. And I believe that's a question that he asks all of us. What do you want? What is it that you want? When we answer that to Jesus, we're not talking about material nonsense stuff. What do you want? Where are you broken in your life? Pastor, I'm lonely. Crippling loneliness. More people than around the lonelier I feel. I try to surround myself with people. I try to, I try to spend time with friends that I, 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 I just have this deepening sense of loneliness. Pastor, I, I'm dealing with this addiction and I'm trying to get over it. But I can't. I try and I fail. I can't. And I try and I fail. And I'm tired. I can't do it. Pastor, I have this relationship that I want restored. It's broken. But I don't know what to do. The more I try to fix it, the worse it gets. Listen, go on and on. What is it? What do you want from Jesus? God, I feel far from you. No matter what I do, I don't feel any closer to you. I want to be close to you. What do you want from Jesus today? What do you want? And I'd say this, whatever it takes for us to connect with Jesus, we do it. That's what Barbara guys did. Whatever it took, whatever it takes today, I'm going to do it. Where's the team? Would you come up very close? Number three, Bartimaeus provides for us a picture of radical discipleship. What does he do? He's called to Jesus. Jesus heals him. Even before Jesus heals him, you know what he does? I love this. He, it, Mark takes the time to tell us a weird detail that really doesn't matter to the narrative. But remember, it's not really about the healing. There's something else Mark's trying to show us. It says that when he got up, he threw his cloak off. That's a weird detail, right? What, what is that? He took his jacket off. He weird. Like, oh, before he went over to be healed, he took his, he took his coat off. He threw it off. See, that cloak, when he's called by Jesus, he throws the cloak away. That cloak is his old identity. That was the cloak of a beggar. That was the cloak of a blind beggar. He would use that cloak to collect any money people threw at him. He didn't have a Starbucks cup. And a cloak... He would sit it in his lap. People throw money on the cloak. And Jesus says, come to me. And you know what? He doesn't say, let me hold on to this in case I still need it. You see how this works out? What does he do? He throws away. Done. I just need to get in front of Jesus. And I know when I'm in front of Jesus, I'm going to be transformed man. I know. I know that Jesus can do what he says he can do. I know that he's the one. I know he's the one that Isaiah said would come and heal the blind. Amen. And he's called me now. I'm, I'm in his presence. I don't need this. Yes. He throws that identity off. I'm done with it. I think sometimes, church, I think there's a lot of us, I think we, we're holding on to our cloaks. We believe in Jesus. I believe we love Jesus. But uh, let me hold on to this old thing. Let me hold on to this old piece of my heart or my mind or this old piece of my identity just in case Jesus doesn't do what he said he's going to do. Or what if he takes too long? Or what if he doesn't do it the way that I want him to do it? I'm going to hold on to this. And I think there's some of us turns that just need to throw our books off. And maybe you haven't received your your miracle yet. Maybe you're still waiting for your breakthrough, but throw that cloak off. And have faith that Jesus is everything that you need today. Do you believe that? 
You know what, even if Jesus doesn't give me what I think I need, because he knows what I need, I think I know what I need. Can I have enough faith to still throw my cloak away? I said, I know that Jesus knows what I need. And I know that he's all that I need today. Throws away that cloak. He throws away that old identity. He cries out to Jesus. He understood that Jesus was more than a man from Nazareth. He knew that he was more than a son of a carpenter. He was more than a rabbi. Jesus was the Messiah. He was the chosen one. He was the son of the living God. And that's all he needed. That's all he needed. Throw off your cloak. Cry out to Jesus and be transformed. That's the call today. That's the invitation. Before we sing, I want to... Let me just bow our heads. Close our eyes. If you're here today, never want to let this opportunity pass. And you've never received your identity in Christ. You've never asked Jesus into your heart. You've never received that new life. And your miracle, your first miracle, the thing that you want is, man, I, I want to be in a relationship with you, Jesus. I want to know that I'm going to go to heaven when I die. I want to know that I'm saved. And the Bible says all I need to do is confess with my mouth, repent of my sins, and declare that you are the Messiah. Just like part of this. If that's you today and you've never done that, I just want to pray with you. I want to give you that opportunity. Would you just raise your hand?
Father, Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your goodness, Lord. We pray for every need, Lord Jesus. We pray for every heart and mind in this room, Lord Jesus. We pray that you would, Lord, we, we know that you hear us, Lord Jesus. We know that you hear the cry of our hearts. And we thank you for that and we give you praise today, Lord Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that you would just increase our faith, Lord Jesus, increase uh, our faith that, uh, and steadfastness and faithfulness, Lord Jesus, and seeking you, Lord Jesus, and, and, and getting to you, Lord Jesus. We declare today, Lord, that, that we need you, Lord. And I pray that you would make us as your people more aware of our desperate need for you, Lord Jesus. Give us an just increased awareness of our reliance and our need for you, Lord Jesus. And in that need, we come to you. And we ask that you would meet us, and we know that you will meet us, Lord. I pray that you would help us to lift one another up, Lord Jesus, in prayer, that we would encourage one another, that we would pray for the breakthroughs that you want to do in families, Lord, in lives today, Lord Jesus. We love you, and we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Church, I love you. I'm so glad you're here today. Let's pray for each other this week. Let's pray for those breakthroughs, not just today, but every day. I know that God's going to give us testimonies this week. Amen. <laughs>